I'm honored here to have with me this incredibly talented group of contributors for our Latinx TV in the 21st century. Yay! Um, Caitlin Woo. Marisol Sweeney is a PhD student at The Ohio State University writing her dissertation focused on feminist Latinx media, including social media platforms like TikTok. She wrote her chapter on Orange is the New Black, the peripheral futurities of multiculturalism and suffering Latinas. Matthew Sandoval is honors faculty fellow at Arizona State University's Barrett, the honors college. He teaches courses on cultural studies, performance studies, popular culture, critical race theory, and his, is himself a performer, storyteller, and documentary filmmaker. Matthew wrote his chapter on Disney, the Disney show Elena of Avalor and Dia de los Muertos. And Stacy Alex is assistant professor of Spanish at Morningside University, Sioux City, Iowa. She has pu published on undocumented Latinx immigrant narratives, Latinx folklore, Latinx pop culture, as well as created an online oral history project, Latinx Stories of Siouxland. Stacy wrote her chapter on the Party of Five reboot and the denaturalization of undocumented Latinx suffering. Welcome. Yeah. Hey. Cool. You guys, we start this. Yeah, How did you get into re researching and writing on Latinx TV, Stacy? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I was just so pleased to see that the section I'm included in about Borderlands uh, TV, um, the chapter by Fojas, starts with the description of Postville, Iowa, right? Um, 2008 was actually the first year that I started teaching high school, right? And so the first faculty meeting that we had, that I was, that I had, um, was about that raid, that ICE raid. And, you know, our, a discussion about what are we gonna do if we are next, if our students and our community is next. And so that really, um, you know, for personal and professional reasons, shook me to my core. Uh, and then when I started graduate school later on, I started looking at representations of that particular raid, um, but also trying to just find representations in general of undocumented experiences and being very disappointed, right, with what I found. Um, and so I started looking at um, work that's created in part by undocumented uh, individuals themselves, but also looking at work that's created by surrogates, right? People who are either formally undocumented or able to speak to undocumented experiences for whatever reason, right? Um, and in terms of TV, this is one of the, the few things I was able to, to find and, and talk about that goes beyond just, you know, one character or one episode that really makes undocumented experiences central to the storyline. Really interesting. Um, let me ask you while I've got you here, like what about for you, what about the reboot of Party of Five um, kind of brought that into the foreground for viewers, but also maybe complicated uh, mainstream understanding of undocumented status? Right. Um, one thing I really appreciate about the story is it does not limit their experiences to their undocumented status, right? They are full human beings living in a, in a full community. Um, they are business owners, they are students, um, they are um, exploring their gender and sexuality, right? Um, and I think the really interesting thing here is that, you know, I grew up in the 90s seeing an episode here or there of the original, right? And I think it's really interesting to think about how we can get viewers to, to watch these stories. How do we, you know, translate something that's really hard, you know, hard to watch and hard to talk about for, uh, for a lot of people. Um, how do we make the medicine go down, right? And so I do think that in some ways overlaying our Latinx characters on original white characters is problematic, right? And Zamora Fuerte has a really great um, article, uh, chapter in here about how the cast is very um, white skinned, right? Mm. But that being said, um, I do think that they do very careful work in terms of creating complicated, complex characters, right? Um, you know, creating models for activism, right? And really not allowing us to walk away from that show um, with just, you know, a simple kind of catharsis, right? That, oh, I'm so grateful that I don't have to live through that, right? I think that show um, really works hard to stay with us and to, to make us question um, our own privilege um, and what it is that we can do in terms of, you know, I, 
are we on the reform side? Are we on the dismantling side, right? Where do we fall in terms of what we want to see moving forward? Mm -hmm. Really great, yeah. Um, Caitlin, how, how did you get into researching on Latinx media, Latinx TV, um, and yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, it has sort of been a bit of a winding path. Um, I think one of the challenges with kind of thinking about um, Orange is the New Black, which is what I chose to write about for my chapter, um, is that when I was an undergrad, that was sort of the same time frame that Orange is the New Black was premiering on Netflix and that you really started to kind of see that shift towards streaming kind of being competitive with um, network television. And so I can really clearly recall the kind of social media reaction to a show like Orange is the New Black of just the enthusiasm and excitement of like, wow, we're seeing so many characters of color. It's a very like women-led show. You also had Genji Cohen as the producer. And there was just sort of like in real time, a really clear response that was sort of overwhelmingly positive. Um, and for me in undergrad, I also had a kind of initially positive reaction in the sense that I was like, wow, I'm realizing I've never seen so many Latina characters in one show um, and in an ensemble cast where you really have sort of substantial speaking lines. And so initially I was very much swept up in that feeling of like, this is great, kind of the, you know, mindset of like representation is sort of all we need to kind of, you know, advance in some way as Latinx folks. Um, but then when I went to my master's program, um, I kind of couldn't shake the fact that, you know, throughout the 2010s, Orange is the New Black kind of prevailed as still the dominant representation. Um, and I chose to kind of write about it as an assignment for one of my classes. And I had a professor who kind of like posed the question to me of like, but why does it matter that you're seeing so many Latinas in one cast? Like what's significant about that? And that question, while at first I was like, well, what do you mean it like wouldn't be significant? Because in some ways I had kind of forgotten that not everyone would have that experience of sort of not growing up with seeing characters that looked like them on television because this was a white professor. Um, but the more I really sat with these characters, the more I started to realize like, oh, in terms of the kinds of representation that we're getting through Orange is the New Black, it's not necessarily really dismantling the way that we still see white characters and especially white women very much kind of in the center of these kinds of ensemble casts and narratives. And so, whereas like in thinking about what Stacey was sharing about kind of Party of Five, one of the challenges for me with Orange is the New Black is kind of coming to terms of the fact that even though these characters and these narratives were so meaningful to me in terms of that visibility, the way that they were on screen wasn't necessarily translating in such a way that I was sort of walking away and feeling good about the opportunities that were being offered for Latinas. And kind of the, I guess, through line with that was realizing that, oh, a show like Orange is the New Black is very much leaving me with the expectation that in order for me to see someone who looks like myself or my family or my friends on screen, we have to really suffer in very visible and kind of hyper visible ways and ultimately also do so in the prison industrial complex in a way that, as I kind of mentioned, Angela Davis poses, it's very much a type of media that kind of, you know, renders the prison hyper visible, but doesn't actually ultimately question sort of why it exists to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, really um, just hearing both of you and Stacy. Um, this kind of moment where of celebration and you know kind of affirmation and then and then a kind of a step back to kind of understand how the narratives are constructed even if you know our first encounter is one of like wow this is like I, I'm gonna jump up and down with you know with joy then being like hold on now now let's like we are given the opportunity and in a way, we're given the privilege because we aren't normally given the opportunity to actually bring nuance and critique into these spaces, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's so, such few kind of representations out there of us in Latinx TV, it's almost like we always have to, you know, celebrate and we're not allowed to bring nuance and critique, <laughs> right? Constructive critique. So yeah, really exciting. Matthew, I know your, you know, your work um, on Dia de los Muertos and then kind of bringing us into the D Disney realm, but how did you like um, in a kind of, I know it's, these are all big long journeys, but how did you get into Latinx media, Latinx TV? Yo, I'm a, I'm a child of the eighties. So my touch points look quite a bit different as an old schooler up here. Um, 
you know, to be honest, I was really engaged even from a very early age in noticing where representation was and where it wasn't on my television box. And back then it really was the television box. You know, you describe it in the book uh, as uh, that gigantic piece of furniture in the living room. That's, that's what I grew up with is that kind of TV. And back in the 80s, you know, I was really turned on like um, by A.C. Slater in Saved by the Bell. You know what I mean? Like that as a young as a young man, like that was the touch point. There, there really weren't any representations. And I thought that even, even though there was a lot of problematic stuff going on in Saved by the Bell with A.C. Slater, it was that moment of like, oh, my God, there's somebody who resonates like it feels familiar. Um, so I would say like it shows like that or even to be honest and um, like WWF, like I don't know anybody who grew up watching professional wrestling, like American wrestling, but like uh, Tito Santana, uh, the Mexican-American, the Chicano wrestler was like a touch point for me. So I, I was always turned on by that stuff. In other words, I was uh, very attuned to where our representation was and where it wasn't. Like it was just very, uh, it was very apparent to me from a very young age. Um, and then I just continued to, to pay attention uh, to that, especially as I became a performer, like doing acting, dance, theater, that kind of stuff. Uh, all of those questions became quite pertinent to my own livelihood. Like, how the hell am I going to get cast? How am I going to create work? Where's my work going to get seen? All of that stuff. So I've been tuned into a lot of this for a while. Um, but with regards to like uh, my chapter on Dia de los Muertos, as somebody who's been researching Day of the Dead uh, in the United States and in Mexico for the past like decade now, I just became very interested, especially in the last decade, the way that Dia de los Muertos was starting to appear in television and cinema, uh, because it's one of those holidays that all of a sudden it's like everywhere. And anytime you want to even signify Latinidad at all, like you throw a sugar skull in there and it's like, oh, okay, that immediately identifies us, locates us, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so I was just becoming more and more interested in the intellectual, basically the critical means by which Day of the Dead becomes this moving signifier to locate uh, Mexicanness, Mexicanidad, Chicanidad, Latinidad, all of these things. But also I've been very, it's very obvious to me that the way Day of the Dead is starting to appear on television and in cinema is directly impacting the way Day of the Dead is celebrated on both sides of the border. Um, so that it's not just a media representation of Day of the Dead, that Day of the Dead on our screens, whether it's our laptops, television, uh, in the cinema, et cetera, is also directly impacting the way it gets understood, recognized by the next generation who are primarily understanding Day of the Dead through the way that it's appearing on screen. Yeah, really important. Um, <clears throat> another example, really deep and important example of why um, how media impacts and why scholarship and the critical kind of teaching of critical tools to students matters, right? Um, so let me ask you, I know that, you know, in many ways, all of our scholarship has kind of twists and turns and big surprises, unexpected surprises. Um, I know, for instance, with Caitlin, um, one of the kind of big surprises for me was Caitlin opening my eyes to just how much of a priority the white uh, woman protagonist gets in the Oranges of the New Black and the kind of prioritizing of that um, subjectivity, even though we do have uh, women of color and Latinx representation happening within the story world. Um, was there was there here in this space or elsewhere in your studies something that was really uh, eye opening for you, Caitlin? And then we'll I'll move the question on to um, Stacy and and Matthew. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think that so there's sort of I guess two origin points for me with this chapter in the sense that I was sort of looking at what was happening in terms of the show's narrative, but then I was also paying a lot of attention to the kind of popular and scholarly response to the show. And something I couldn't help but notice was that in looking at how people were talking about the show and writing about the show, they were really talking around the women of color. Um, and 
it kind of unlocked in some ways what was so unsettling for me in terms of watching the show itself is that like when you really look at sort of the scholarly response and popular response to the ensemble cast kind of thinking back to um just this issue of sort of what ultimately starts to stand in for Latinx folks and Latinidad, the kind of consistent framework that folks would use to talk about the show is very much like, it's diverse, it's inclusive, it's unique. The ensemble cast is sort of the foundational reason why the show should be recognized as the kind of most important show of the 2010s. And especially, I would increasingly see kind of TV critics make the argument that like, you really have to pay attention to Orange is the New Black to understand the shifts that are happening in streaming, but also the shifts that are happening in terms of opportunities for performers of color um, in knowing that Uzo Aduba did win um, awards for her performance in Orange is the New Black and the cast as a whole, you know, got recognized with SAG recognitions and whatnot. Um, but when you actually kind of look for, and I kind of almost approached it like a scavenger hunt of, if I look at a large kind of amount of you know, scholarly takes and popular takes on the show, how many of them are actually talking about the Latina women and Black women in the show? And there really are not that many. A good majority of them actually kind of reify the issues with the show itself in the sense that although Orange is the New Black shows women of color on screen, if you really pay attention to their screen time, it's, it's so much less than that of Piper, our kind of white protagonist. And in the scholarship that's really developed around the show, there's a similar problem that occurs that even though many critics and kind of, you know, scholars are hypercritical of Orange is the New Black's kind of fascination with Piper as being our way into the show, they devote much of their time to kind of talking about the issues with Piper that they never even get to women of color to begin with. And so it'll be a very kind of marginal comment, whether it's one sentence or a footnote where they kind of acknowledge, oh, and women of color are represented in problematic ways. And so I wanted to really disrupt that with this chapter and kind of ask the question of what would it look like to focus on Latina women? And especially in recognizing that the times that we have had an acknowledgement of how black women in the show are represented, it's mostly been sort of portrayed through the lens of the fact that we've had really upsetting and disturbing kind of death sequences for black women on the show. Um, and outside of kind of those takes on sort of the issues with how the shows try to situate itself alongside Black Lives Matter, there's really not a lot of scholarship or takes on kind of Latina representation in the show. And so I wanted to think about what would it mean to really um, consciously focus on Latina women and how the way that they show up most in the show is through plot twists that also ultimately end in their demise, but differently than how Black women's demise is portrayed. Mm. Yeah, so, so awesome um, and so important. It also speaks to a kind of general trend in spite of the fact that we're seeing more Latinx representation in front and behind cameras, but where the continued presence of what we might call or I might have called or some of us have already called the kind of white aspirational narrative right, that um, kind of blankets everything. So even though that we have representation, we have to kind of do a double take and, and kind of really peel back and make sure or see whether or not it's actually um, a representation that falls into that white, white aspirational kind of narrative, right? Mm -hmm. um, Stacy, I know that in your work, um, what, what's been really beautiful and sort of I think important for people to see too is that, um, you know, when we do do our homework and we do take something seriously and there's a great kind of will to style or intentionality in the reconstruction of story, Latinx story, um, it can be something really remarkable. Maybe um, you wanna talk about a little bit about that or anything else. Yeah. Um... Uh, so I, I appreciate the question because um, while watching the credits for um, one of the episodes, I noticed the name Edgar Campos um, at, as um, a consultant, right? And I can't remember what exactly the credit was, but I was determined as the daughter of a journalist to figure out who Edgar Campos was and how I could get in touch with him. And um, luckily he was, um, well, first he was shocked that anybody cared and was calling him, right? Um, but he was very happy to talk to me about his work and consulting in terms of 
um, what would actually happen, right? Um, and th thinking through the legality and, um, you know, what would happen when ICE shows up to, um, the, to the family's restaurant or, or a place that they're, um, they're protesting, right? Um, and we know, right, from, you know, Coco, right, that like big corporations are now hiring consultants, right? And does that make representation perfect? No, but is it better? Hopefully, right? Hopefully it's better. Um, and Edgar Campos is not a lawyer himself, um, but is very much uh, active in um, California politics um, and um, consulted with lawyers um, and has quite a bit of uh, grassroots networking and um, in LA. Um, and so, you know, he did make some corrections, right? He made some corrections on, on set. Um, and he talked about, right, we don't want to use Spanish in ways that are patronizing, for example. Um, don't want to use that, that um, mock Spanish, right? Um, and he also made um, some su suggestions about, um, you know, what the, the warrant needs to look like and, you know, how, how workers might react or not react, right? Um, and, and mentioned to me that, there are some recent examples um, in which they don't get it quite right, like um, Henthified, um, the, the end of that season one, um, an ice truck pulls up, right? And, um, you know, takes away the, the main character. And I haven't seen season two, but his point was that it, it's a little bit troubling, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it might give the impression that that was is something that happens a lot. And we're talking about a place that's a sanctuary city, right? In which police shouldn't be working in concert with ICE, which doesn't mean it, it can't happen, right? But we don't want to stoke fear where we don't need to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we want to get it as, as right as we can. So does that, does that help yeah. a little bit? Yeah, okay. no, yeah, no, it's great. Um, uh, um, Matthew, how about you and your work on Disney and the, uh, and, um, I don't know, other films like Coco and stuff maybe? You know. <laughs> Yeah, you just brought up Coco. I mean, for me, a lot of this started back in 2013 when Disney mm -hmm. audaciously tried to trademark the Dia de los Muertos. Uh, you know, I remember I was living in LA at the time, uh, going to the Burbank offices for the protests. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like that, that was a very a punctuated moment for me. But like um, with, with the essay that I wrote for this um, amazing book, <laughs> uh, for this amazing book. Um, I was really interested in just Elena of Avalor more generally, you know, as, uh, as Disney's first Latina princess, which is also, it was, I mean, you, you said this earlier, there is this simultaneous, there's like a schism when I, mm -hmm. I see Latinx representation in film, when I see representation in film and television where I'm like, I'm celebratory. I'm like, yo, we're here, let's go. But then it's like, okay, then you got to start asking a little bit more difficult questions. Uh, and so I was really enamored, uh, first of all, cause I got little uh, nieces and nephews who really loved this Disney show. Um, on the other hand, it also became uh, obvious to me as I watched more episodes of this Latina princess show that there was a lot of cultural translation work happening that really you refer to it in the book, Aldama, as, uh, as the white oculi versus the brown oculi, which I think is so uh, such a, a useful concept for us to think about that it seemed to me like this was made for a white audience. So therefore, even though the creators, the actors, the writers were Latinx, that they still having to translate cultura for uh, a white audience to be able to understand what's going on. And what was super fascinating for me is all of the things that get lost in that cultural translation when you're trying to explain aspects of Latinx culture to a white audience, there's a lot of stuff that gets dropped or there's a lot of stuff that gets reinterpreted in this new way. And of course, as a scholar of Dia de los Muertos, I was like, oh my, they did like three episodes about Day of the Dead on there, all of which framed Day of the Dead never in its religious terms and never, ever, ever even used the word death. Like they didn't address death. The whole thing was framed as this gigantic party where it's a celebration and it's a party and they would have like death and skull iconography but they would not say the word death um and to me i was like oh my gosh what a this is an opportunity for them to not only allow 
um, young audiences of whatever race to understand this beautiful holiday and really understand it. They miss that opportunity, but then they also miss the opportunity to open up strong conversations uh, about what death is, what death means, which is what Dia de los Muertos offers a younger generation, uh, an opportunity to really understand death and life in that sense. And so I was like, oh man, missed opportunity here. So I was simultaneously like, yes, Elena Vavalor, you're so amazing. Uh, but also, damn it, you missed these opportunities. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. but that, but that's where our work lies as scholars. You know what I mean? Like we have to, we have to simultaneously celebrate and ask those harder questions, which this book does in every single chapter. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, Matthew, you brought up so your sobrinos and, you know, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you guys, whether it's you as a parent or you as an educator, you know, how do we sit with the, our little ones or, or our students and kind of get, you know, let allow them the joy of Elena at the same time, you know, from kind of their position where they are in their lives and their development, let them kind of talk to you and then allow that kind of critical formation to happen, um, whether it's the little ones or the ones in our classrooms. Um, Matthew, why don't we start with you, given that you were talking about your nieces and nephews? <laughs> yeah, you know, when it comes to um, when it comes to that media, I will say, like, I do take the opportunity after watching shows and movies with the kiddos to really explain deeper stuff to them. And that's also obviously because I'm a professor and I'm a, you know, a, a theory head that way. Like, I got to break stuff down for them because I'm trying to make sure that they can see the world critically as well. Um, so, like, uh, even when I took them to Coco. You know, like it, this made everybody in my family cry. On the other hand, Coco missed a lot of opportunities and had to require some re-explaining, which I did kind of once we got home, I had to explain that to him. So, uh, but you know, mine are nine, six and three. So um, there's a lot of different kind of side conversations that get that happen. But I would say that's been one of the biggest challenges for me in the classroom though, to talk about like, um, uh, students like classroom students is um, when I teach like race and pop culture uh, there is I would say this kind of expectation in some sense from most of the students that the class is going to be celebratory in nature in other words like let's celebrate this uh, these mm -hmm. representations and let's talk about how it's different than than white representations, which is only like just the base part of it. It's really asking harder questions and making them get uncomfortable with things that they really love. And to me, that's never a way to erase the media that they love, te television or cinema. It's a way to make them love it in a different way. Uh, mm -hmm. But that takes a lot of work in the classroom. That takes a lot of work of asking hard questions, of asking uh, harder questions of the media that we're watching. Uh, but I would say that's a lot of like orientation work that I have to do in the first several weeks of teaching a class uh, that's dedicated to race and pop culture, race and television, race and film, et cetera, is getting them into the space of like, okay, we're gonna move from that celebratory aspect to like, can we ask harder questions of what's going on here? So cool, Caitlin. Yeah, oh, I'm just resonating a lot with what Matthew's saying. I'm just like, yes. I'm just like trying to consciously not say yes to every point. <laughs> um, I think, so funny enough, I kind of think about my mom in this because like, the more that I've been sort of looking at social media studies and thinking about how that kind of, you know, for me, creates some really interesting bridges from sort of legacy media and other types of, you know, more established media that we've had up until now. One of the things that kind of was useful to me in thinking about celebrity studies scholarship was this point um, that I've seen a few scholars make of, for so many of us, kind of the way that we interact with each other around celebrity culture and media culture is through a form of gossip of like, did you see this thing that was on this tabloid cover or you know, did you see what happened at the Oscars, right? And when I think about my relationship with my mom, one of the ways that we've really related to each other um, has been through, you know, my mom, you know, posing these questions whenever I talk with her on Zoom of, you know, did you see this thing? Or did you know this thing about this celebrity? Um, she's in a very Keanu Reeves era right now. But, you know, one of the things that like has been interesting is that as I work on my dissertation and like focus on people like Rita Hayworth, my mom's relationship to Rita Hayworth is very different than mine. And so I found that like, 
one of the ways that we kind of relate to each other is sometimes more so from the marketing perspective first and then kind of work our way into talking about the content of a specific film or a specific TV show. And like, I think that that part is really important because one of the things I always want to kind of be conscious of in writing and also just in like talking with folks I care about is that we all have different relationships to media, but I never want to come off as like suggesting like, I know the one true way to read this thing. And like this insight that I'm bringing into it is like the only way that's sort of like a, a way of assigning value, right? And so like when I talk to my mom or my abuela, like I wanna really honor and recognize that like there are aspects of these really complicated messy portrayals that do invite joyfulness or do invite that kind of celebration that we've been talking about. Um, and that we don't have to let entirely go of that joy in our critique of these of these medias and so like I find it really interesting to kind of hear from my mom like what is it about a Rita Hayworth that you know resonates for you or Salma Hayek or whoever it might be and then I find that it kind of has created a more meaningful honestly nuanced exchange between the two of us then that I can kind of you know bring in you know especially as she started watching things on Netflix you know here's the show that really stands out to me and here are the issues that I have with it um, and I think that that kind of creates an opportunity to not only have these kind of multi-generational conversations, but also to kind of retain that awareness to how do folks outside of the academy engage with these texts and how can we really think about a kind of co-creative process in which we honor and recognize the kind of, you know, again, joys that come from it, even as much as we also kind of call for, you know, ways that we can kind of sit with a critical lens when engaging with these TV shows and movies. Yeah, really wonderful. Um, yeah, because we the last thing we want to don't the last thing we want in our classroom, our spaces of learning, wherever they are, and they're everywhere, is to um, curtail or even cut off conversation, dialogue. Right? Gosh, we live in a world right now where everybody is so siloed and so ready to to cut off and not listen and not kind of act with grace and humility. So yeah, I love, I love that, um, Caitlin. Stacy, how, how about you? Um, I kind of have a, a real um, open conversation with students about what I don't want them to take away from, from our conversations, right? Which is that um, ways, for example, um, Which Way Home, right? Is a documentary about um, undocumented children uh, traveling North, right? Um, and that and then Enrique's journey have been used in college classrooms to help students talk about their own transitions in life, right? And just this really mm -hmm. cringeworthy kind of way. And so I, I'm very upfront about that. Um, mm -hmm. And then when we're looking at, um, when we do get a chance to look at TV, um, you know, we'll start with Ramirez Berg. Um, but then I also really look for those fun, like TV, social, like um, YouTube moments that can break it down for students. Um, you guys know Cat Call on um, mm -hmm. YouTube, yeah. Um, so she's got this really great breakdown of kind of five uh, main stereotypes, mm -hmm. um, and students really react to that, and they can identify those stereotypes and things they're watching. Um, and then I often have students look at film trailers, and rather than you know good versus bad, right? We look at you know what are the things we take away from this that could be empowering or productive. Um, what are things that you know we want to be critical about, and we want to. Um, we want to push back against, right? Um, and so recently, um, I need to update my my uh, choices here. But I've been using um, film trailers for El Chicano and <laughs> Overboard, the the remake of Overboard, right? Um, and then I actually have them listen to the, some of the podcasts that um, you and Caitlin put together um, to help them think through the the representations of the Latinas and, and El Chicano. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have students like kind of like um, Caitlin mentioned, you know, they're they're all having these conversations with each other about TV and movies that I'm not aware of, right? So I have them self, I have them choose what um, media they want to look at um, when they're when they're writing. I don't, you know, assign them to watch anything. And it's really helpful, I think, because then they get to have these conversations with each other about what they're watching. Right? So. Mm, really cool. Um, so speaking of cat call, um, other innovative televisual. Um, show story spaces that you've come across that you might want to kind of give a shout out here and a follow-up to that will be like 
in an ideal world where where would you like to see Latinx TV travel in the future? So um, an innovative televisual performance show space and then in a kind of nice kind of segue from that, like where would you like things to, where would you like TV to be in the future? Um, Matthew. Yo, I'll be honest. Um, I know that we have representation in sci-fi but it's got to be at the level of creation because we've always had uh, Latinx actors in in sci-fi, um, TV and and cinema. Like that's been there. There's been that that casting, um, and in recent years, there's been more writing. But um, you know, Robert Rodriguez floated this idea several years ago about machete in space. And I was like, you know what? That's that's not that far fetched. I mean, I, obviously, it's far fetched. But to me. Given that science, if I'm reading pop culture in any way correctly, it seems like um, it seems like science fiction is just becoming more and more popular as its own particular genre. And so I would love to see more representation there uh, in terms of just like creating new shows and creating because it's sci-fi, literally creating new worlds like Latinx worlds that just we don't know what they look like. We have to dream them up. We have to dream them into existence. That aspect of dreaming some a new world that doesn't exist in reality. Because uh, to me, when I see a lot of uh, Latinx television right now, it's so reality-based. It really is. Uh, and that's part of its appeal right now is like, it It seems like these are stories drawn from real people's life. It's got that gritty reality to it, which, which is all well and good. I'm not, I'm not uh, talking smack about that at all. But to me, I'm like the next maneuver for me that I would really love to see is just really double down on science fiction production in, in a major way. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you too. <laughs> um, Caitlin, how about you? Um, I always want to plug social media because I'm a fan. Um, also because it's like my focus of my dissertation. Um, I think, you know, TikTok and Instagram and YouTube for me are kind of the trifecta. I think Twitter's interesting in different ways, but really between Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, I think you get really interesting short form and long form content. I also think with social media, there's a really important way in which Indigenous folks and Afro-Latinx and Black Latinx folks and folks who have also divested from the term Latinx because of the anti-Blackness and anti-Indigeneity in our communities have sort of really innovatively used these spaces to create, you know, opportunities for consciousness raising, opportunities also for just kind of challenging the dominant ways we've thought about Latinx representation. And for me, I'm always thinking about through that through Latinas and beauty. Um, so I think for me, I'd really like to see kind of a connective tissue forming a little bit more between social media and legacy media, because I think there's a lot of overlap between traditional celebrities and kind of folks who are, you know, girls like me who are like regular people from their bedrooms who are posting things. Um, and I think that, you know, for me, Latinx TV also is kind of moving in that direction as well, because so much of the you know, self-mediation methodologies we see on YouTube are really taking cues from legacy television. And I think when you really kind of look at the subgenres and communities that form on a space like YouTube and TikTok, you can really kind of see ways that folks are really responding to these representations that we're so familiar with in what we're writing about here. Are there any sh other shout outs you'd like to give to some of those social media spaces that are really kind of innovating and vital right now? I don't have one off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to, to share those cool. later. Cool, cool, yeah, no worries. Um, um, and then Stacy. Yeah, um, so I, in terms of thinking about undocumented characters, um, most of the things, so, you know, Party of Five got canceled, right? Um, so that's disappointing, right? So we need to mm. find, find um, support in terms of having multiple seasons, um, be able to to take you know carry these stories where they deserve to go, um, you know, and she was like one day at a time, um, you know, really needed that fan base to to drive them forward, right? Um, and they needed loud fans to to make that happen, um, and so, you know, most of the the examples I'm coming up with are actually comics, right? But comics mm -hmm. that I think could very much very easily be translated into TV, right? Um, so. Um, Scholar Comics, right, um, is a Chicago-based uh, artist. And Fede, her name is escaping me. Um, <laughs> yes, give me a quick. second. Give me a um, second. 
she's amazing. So I'll just mention that she's also an educator, right? And has um, designed a lot of her characters based on her work uh, in, in education with her students, right? And she has Rosita, who is an undocumented uh, child, right? Um, and yeah, I. but I also like thinking about the Marvel universe and thinking about um, Laura Molina's, right? The Jaguar, right? Like um, the Jaguar is there to, to protect all the people. And there's um, in LA, right? And there's this kind of like gesture to um, fear, right? In the nineties of, of any um, person uh, of color being mistaken as undocumented, right? Um, during all of, you know, the politics of the nineties in California, um, what, where are undocumented superheroes, right? Um, so not those that are just, you know, not those who are just protecting, right? And putting undocumented characters in these kinds of passive victim roles, right? Um, so, you know, I, I just think there's a lot of, there's a lot of room for growth in terms of representing agency of undocumented communities. Yeah, I'm really glad you guys brought up um, the power and possibility of kind of inter and transmediality, right? Um, as opening spaces. And even Caitlin, I put you on the spot. I, in a way, I kind of did that unfairly because you were talking about media to come, story worlds to be built. Um, they don't, they're not quite, we're not quite there yet. Um, but I think that Stacy and, you know, Matthew, you're talking about instances where we're seeing it, but then gestures toward a future where something like Caitlin's transmediality will come together for us and really allow us to, uh, you know, express the stories that we want to. Um, really amazing. I just want to thank all of you for, you know, gifting us your time here and for the volume. And if anybody wants to get a hold of our incredible contributors here um, and, you know, um, see more of their work, Stacy is at Morningside College. And as I mentioned, um, we have Matthew Sandoval there at Arizona State and Caitlin Sweeney, Caitlin Marisol Sweeney at The Ohio State University writing her dissertation. Thank you.